Lord shall be. We say it every Sunday, hopefully on other days of the week too. We say it, but do we believe it? We say it, but do we live as if it were the very truth at that very moment that Christ is in our midst? One of the great challenges that many, if not most of us face, is that when it comes to Christ, we have not given every part of ourselves or our lives to Him. There are places, there are times, there are settings in which we don't think about Christ, which we don't really act or think or feel as if Christ is, in fact, among us. We don't include Him in those times and places, in our choices, in our behaviors, in our attitudes. Now, on Friday, I was at the post office, and the guy in front of us went up and he asked for two sheets of stamps. And he said, give me one sheet of religious stamps and one sheet of not religious stamps. <laughs> now, I'm not a big fan of uh, wearing your faith on your sleeve or on your envelope, as the case may be. But I thought it was kind of interesting that he would pick one religious and not, not religious. Somewhere along the line, he, he made a, a conscious decision that he was going to represent himself with a religious connection to some and not say it to others. I'm sure it's not that uncommon in the post office or anywhere else for that matter. We all know there are times when we choose to mute our witness. When I go to the grocery store, I normally am not dressed like this. There may be other times when we blare our witness. Maybe your house is covered with many lights right now. But today, let us not worry about that, because that's just an everyday problem I think we all face. But what about the times, not when it's an issue of the world outside, but within ourselves? Internally. When we live a divided life. What do I mean? We all likely find ourselves thinking, reacting, behaving, speaking differently depending on the circumstances. At work, we're a different person most of the time than we are at play. Ask my wife and she will confirm to you that there are certain friends and family members when I get around them, I regress entirely to a completely adolescent spaz. <laughs> And I'm not embarrassed to do so. Though I probably would tone it down around you. I don't want you to realize how nerdy I really am. There are other times that bring out more sober qualities, the more stoic, priestly figure you've seen before you. And there are songs, sounds, and smells, places that might bring out total different sides of who we are than what others normally see. And you know what? This itself is not a bad thing. It's natural. It's a basic aspect of human life. But what about those places or people or memories even, which trigger within us signs that maybe aren't so good, that they do not bring us peace or joy to the world within ourselves or even to others? Now, a few months ago, I found myself falling into an all too familiar funk, and not the kind of funk that I prefer. It has bass guitars and stuff. A, gl a, a, a glum funk. And it was brought on probably with no good reason or excuse, just from an overexposure to old places, old patterns, old bad habits, spending a little too much time on myself and not spending enough time in my walk with the Lord. So I found myself given to surly, short-tempered, 
attitude, bad attitude on some days, and then on another day, a glum and lazy, depressed, morose kind of a <coughs> mood on others. And eventually it got so bad that it was, it was as if I had fallen back after all the years of spiritual uh, experiences and blessings that I've been so, I'm so grateful to have experienced as a Christian, as a priest, as your priest, that didn't matter. It was as if I was right back where I started, uh, an unhappy high school kid or something, an angry teenager, angst-driven and so forth. I thought, how did I get here again? How did I end up? You ever have a dream where you, if you're not in school, if you're in school, maybe this doesn't make any sense, but when you get to be my age, you should still have a dream where you, you're suddenly back in high school or middle school, and you wonder, what am I doing here? Why? I can't remember my locker combination. I don't know where my glasses are. Why am I stuck here? Did I get beyond this? And that's how I felt, that hopeless sense of I'm stuck back in this place. In exasperation, I cried out, can I ever escape, Lord? Can I ever get out of this place? And I began to, want to wonder how it had happened. What part of me so long dormant had reasserted itself so vigorously, vengefully, to make me feel so low? But I began to realize that as I looked at it, one of the things that defined this place within me was a place where Jesus Christ was not. And that was the defining characteristic. It was a place where I had forgotten that Jesus Christ is in our midst and ever shall be. Not in my thoughts, not in my awareness. If I thought of him, he seemed only distant, distant and disconnected from my life at that point. The dark place of my soul that did not know Jesus. Not because he was not there or he could not be there, but simply because in the times of my life where I had cultivated, cultivated this place within me, I never invited him in. I never asked him to be a part of my life at that time, in this spiritual pit. And so, he was not in my midst. Now, I have, if you can relate to this, you may have done this too, many times cried out to the Lord, Lord, get me out of here. Take me away from this place. Take me out of my rut. Take me out of my funk. Take me out of my despair. But I had never actually offered instead to give it to him. Not to take me out of it, but to say, come into it. Take it over. Be present with me in my darkness. The place had begun perhaps as a shelter from the storms of life, from the disappointments of youth. But now this place had become obsolete, a prison of memories and bad habits and bad attitudes. But most of all, it was still a part of me. It was not different from me. It was a place within me. And it was a place that I had yet not given over to Jesus Christ. Now, right about this time I was trying to make sense of all of this, I heard uh, a pretty amazing story from a man who was a survivor of child abuse. Now he had been undergoing therapy and he was going through the process typical of, of therapy trying to remember and relive all these kind of terrible experiences to face them. Many painful things which I'm grateful that I never had to face in my life. And as he was in that place, he was asked to now call out for help from within that moment of abuse in his memory. And he realized the great pain that he had because he realized that one of the reasons he never called out for help when he was at that stage of his life, why he never called out for his father to help him, for example, because he was too ashamed or he didn't believe that his father would truly hear him or truly understand. And so he buried it all. And now the guy's older than me, and he's working on it in therapy. But then instead of just leaving him in that point of horrible despair, the therapist asked him now, call for help for someone who can be there. Call out to God. 
And in that moment, he, looking back at his life, saw Jesus Christ standing there in the midst of the abuse itself and weeping. Weeping not only for him and what he was suffering, but even weeping for the abuser. Weeping for the person who was doing what they did not know. And for some reason, this vision of Christ weeping for him and even for the abuser was enough to give him comfort. It was enough for him to change his whole experience. It didn't change the narrative. It didn't try to say, Jesus came in and took me away. Or Jesus came in and knocked that guy out of the park and drove him away. No, it didn't change what happened. The past is the past, is the past, and it will not be changed. But what it gave him was an understanding that he was not alone, that he was not abandoned, that he was not helpless or hopeless, and that Christ was in his hands. I can't explain why it worked for him. But it touched me too, and I thought I'd share a story. Just to know that we are not alone in our suffering. Too often we ask God to take us out of our pain and suffering instead of doing something even greater for us by coming into it and transforming it and redeeming it and enlightening it. The result is when we ask him to get out of it and we give in to any manner of methods of escaping from our pain, is that we think we have overcome our pain if we're not feeling it. But all we have done is just deferred it. All we have done is just buried it. Put it aside. Negative feelings that result, the bad attitudes, the bad behaviors, the bad memories, they can and often do reassert themselves then later especially when triggered by exposure to those things which remind us, especially peoples and places and songs and so forth. This may be why the holidays, that wonderful time of the year, the most wonderful time of the year, is so often so awful <laughs> at some point. Because even as much as we try to be joyful and happy and at peace, there are things which remind us of the ways in which the past and the world is not necessarily always a great place. And we can fall into a terrible relapse of anger and frustration, especially when we get around maybe our family members or our old stomping grounds. So if we truly want to be free and to move forward in our life, sometimes we actually do have to take a step back. Sometimes to see the way ahead, we have to turn around and clear the wreckage of our past, which is holding us up. Eventually, we cannot keep asking God to take us away from our problems and from our past and from our pain cannot take us out of ourselves. And that's the problem. Instead, what we need to do is invite him into it, into us. So brothers and sisters, it's Advent right now. What does the word Advent mean? Literally, it means the coming, right? The coming of Christ. And one of the great prayers of the New Testament comes from the Aramaic. And it's just one word, Maranatha. And it means, come, O Lord, or come, our Lord. This is the prayer of Advent. When we wait and we hope and we prepare ourselves in our celebration of remembering that Christ came among us and dwelt in the manger of this life with us and walked with us and suffered with us and shared our burdens and our pains. So let us make Maranatha our prayer this Advent. As we look at whatever is trying to drag us back into whatever pits and ruts we've dug for ourselves over the course of our lives, 
let us, instead of running from them this year, let us rather say, come Lord, come Lord Jesus, into my darkness and make me light. Come Lord Jesus, into my fear and my hopelessness and make me courage. Come Lord Jesus, into my loneliness and my isolation and make me one with you. Come, Lord Jesus, into every aspect of my life, both hidden and manifest, seen and unseen, and make me whole once again. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Christ is among us. He is among us.